Okay, gang, as promised, here is part two of the Internet Protocol video. During this one, we're going to talk about some of the things that we just introduced last time and some of the advanced ideas, such as fragmentation, that are also part of IP. All right, for those of you following along, remember that we are in Chapter 3 of the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols. All right, and here's the packet that we've been working off of. Just a couple of reminders here that this is a Wireshark capture showing us the individual fields and at the bottom there you can see the hex. Now the important detail or one of the important details to get out of this is that we're looking at a header of an IP packet that's 20 bytes long. Last time we talked a lot about the fields but also the addresses used in an IP packet. But a reasonable question to ask is where does my address come from? Well you can statically assign or manually assign an address to a node, but you can get into trouble if you don't understand all of the values that are required. So for example, if you forget to put in a default gateway or a name server, uh, then your packets won't go anywhere. Now the other way to get an IP address is automatically. And the two ways to get one automatically are either via DHCP server or with zero config. So if you've ever seen a 169.254 address, that was a zero config address. It's not good for much other than ad hoc networking, uh, but that's a subject for another day. Uh, dynamic host configuration protocol usually is what we use to give out IP addresses, but they also give us a whole bunch of other things like servers and gateways and the name servers that allow us to communicate and get things down on the network. Well, now that we know we can have a wide variety of IP addresses and reside on many different kinds of networks, where did those 192 addresses come from? Well, it turns out that 192 is actually part of what we call private addressing, and these are used in conjunction with network address translation, or NAT. There are actually three different address ranges associated with uh, private addressing, and they're listed here. One of the most common places that you'll see 192s or private address in use is in SOHO networks or especially in homes. Now that also means that that wireless home gateway or your home gateway device is actually not just giving you an IP address via DHCP but is also a router and there are several other functions that it might serve. This slide is a repeat for one that we saw in part one but it's just here to remind us about our old friend the network mask. The network mask is really important for the forwarding of packets and we use it all the time. And each class of address, and really we'll find out each size of address regardless of class, requires a network mask to help us figure out where packets have to go. Anding is a logical operation or a mathematical operation depending on how you want to look at it. And what you do is you take an IP address and end it with a network mask. And this will tell you either the network that you're residing on or the destination network. And this is what we use to figure out how we're going to forward packets. So host uses these and routers use these. Now using this value, we actually look up in the routing table to determine which interface we have to use to forward the packet. Now this is a fairly complex idea, so I'm not going to do any more with it than we already have right now. But there's an entire chapter on this in the book, and there's a webcast out on O'Reilly to help you through this topic. Here's another reminder slide. You may recall last time when we went through all the definitions, but what I want you to get out of this one right now is that all of these are special addresses, and almost every single node on the network has each one of these special addresses in its routing table, sometimes more than one version. And so we have to be able to figure out how we're going to process each one of these addresses in addition to the 192's or the network addresses or the 169's that we've talked about. So here's the host routing table. It contains the actual values for the ones represented on the previous slide. Now host routing is a whole topic unto itself and so I've devoted a chapter to it, but I'll introduce some of the basic ideas here. You have a source and destination IP address. This table is used to perform those anding operations with the masks in the second column. Using those two anding operations for the source and destination, we decide how we're going to forward them. The host then uses, once he has the result, 
The host uses the results in the third and fourth column to figure out the proper interface and the gateway that has to be used. All right, so I promised a discussion on fragmentation. Now, in the IP header, we have a lot of fields, but the ones that we're concerned about when we're talking about fragmentation will be the identification, the flags field, and the fragment offset. What we see here are two things. One is the conversation, that's the top frame. And then the square on the bottom contains the two packets that are part of the fragmented packet. So what I did was I created a ping command that was just big enough to force the creation of two Ethernet frames to carry the data. So if we look at the bottom, the first thing that we have to notice is that the identification 7526 or 01D66 and hex are the same for the two packets. Now the top one is the first packet, so we can see that the flags field is set, indicating that there are more fragments to come, but the fragment offset is zero, which tells us that it is the beginning of the fragment. In the bottom frame, what we see is that we're fragmented 1480 bytes in and that there are no other fragments to come. Now 1480 is significant because that is the largest payload that we could have in, in an IP packet, with the IP header being 20 bytes long and the Ethernet frame only capable of carrying a packet of 1500 bytes. Now the last thing I'll talk about in this podcast or video is the fact that an IP header can change. Normally, I mean almost all of the time, an IP header will be 20 bytes, but every once in a while you'll get one that's a little out of whack. What I did in this case is I used the ping command to ask it to record the route that it uh, traversed. So this packet is going to include in it information regarding the hops. The only place to put that is after the normal 20 bytes. So in this case, the IP header is going to be longer. So there are cases where you can either specify the path that a packet is to follow or ask it to record the route. And that's what I did here. And we can see that in the bottom part of this header, the hops or the router interfaces that this packet touched are included. So the IP packet itself, at least the header, is larger than normal. Well, thanks again for listening and watching. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at bhhics at rit.edu, and you can visit us at RIT's NSSA webpage. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destination.